The alphabet continues. We're nearing the midway points to talk about some games to start with the letter L. Lizard. <laughs> oh, man. Oh, Which one is... Oh, that's my left hand. Okay, cool. What's up, everybody? My name is Nick. I'm Mike. We're the Brothers Murphy. That's right. We're continuing our alphabet series. Uh, we're about halfway. We're about right we're around the halfway it. point. And we're so, nearing um, it. Uh, yeah, it's been really, really fun to kind of talk about games because it kind of forced you to talk about games maybe you wouldn't talk about a normal kind of top 10 Yeah, list. that's the kind of idea with us going through the, this list this way. It's just like a fun opportunity to kind of talk about a, a you know, a, a wide range of We are going to have to talk about a hundred different games. Yeah, which because is Because it's sweet. 10 games per list, you know. Actually, no, no, 260. Well, it's not quite, well, not quite but, but yeah, a lot of somewhere games. Somewhere around 200, yeah. yeah. So, but no, this is going to be games that start with L. Let's go to get right into it. Alrighty, our number 10 is going to be Lanterns. This is one of the first games we got when we started playing board games. It was like this, Pandemic, Zombies had a couple others, but Lanterns is always one that I heard was a very chill, relaxing game. Lanterns, the Harvest Festival is a game where you are gonna be putting out these lanterns tiles. They're gonna be these square tiles that have lanterns on four sides of them. They can be lots of different colors and you're putting them out on the lake and it's basically kind of those, you know, like at last I see the light, you know? And so it's like the lanterns all on the lake. And so you're basically trying to match lantern color to lantern color. That's gonna get you a card. Um, and that matches that card. And you're basically turning these cards as set collection for points because you're dedicating these to the emperor. And so those are dedication points. And so the cool thing about Lanterns, and this is kind of the first game that I ever played that was really like this, where there's not really much downtime because every single turn, you're gonna be getting one of these Lantern cards. Because when you place a Lantern tile out, if you make any color matches, you will get those color cards, but then everyone gets the card of the Lantern color that's pointing at them. So it's a four player game. So someone's sitting here, 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 and here. I put out a square tile. I'll get this lantern. They'll get that lantern, that lantern, and then that lantern. So you're always getting stuff on each other's turn. So it's a nice relaxing game, but you do have to think about what you're putting down to get you the things you want, but also not give everyone else whatever they need to turn in these cards to get dedication points. It's really nice, relaxing. It's just fun and I still love it. Number nine is Long Shot the Dice Game. This definitely goes down for us as like one of the I, I, like biggest surprises, I think maybe for us. Uh, we covered this game a long time ago uh, when it first was on crowdfunding and stuff. And it is a, a roll and write horse racing game where you are making wagers on which horse you think is going to uh, win the race. You have the ability to uh, make it, augment the race a little bit to move certain horses forward or make it more often, uh, more likely that a certain horse will activate and move forward. You're making wagers, you're completing rows and columns of these concessions to get various bonuses like money and free bets and, and uh, stuff like that. You can even like purchase horses with your money. Your money is kind of your points and stuff, but if that horse places high in the race, you can get a big return on that investment. And one thing I really like is that certain horses have better odds of winning than others do. The, the number one horse is most likely to win. The number eight is the long shot. It's hard to make the eight place, but their payouts are much better. And so if you can make it so that the eight wins, you can really get a lot of cash. And you're gonna be rolling dice each turn, which gives you a number and a color. Uh, and you are gonna be using those dice to cross off stuff on your board. So I just love that this race always turns out compelling. It always ends up to be a close race. A horse that you maybe don't, maybe don't expect to win, wins. Uh, and the the turns are very simple. There's a lot of simultaneous play. So you can play literally from one player to eight and it works great at all those player counts. That is long shot the dice game. Number eight is by Phil Walker Harding, praise be, as we always say, love some Phil Walker Harding. This is gonna be Llama Land. Llama Land is a great game that I feel like kind of got, kind of came and went, unfortunately. I think it's a great game because it's kind of an amalgamation of a lot of different Phil Walker Harding games. There's a little bit of Baron Park, a little bit of Gingerbread House. Um, this is a game where you're gonna be building up, I don't know if it's officially like Machu Picchu, but it's kind of like around that area. You're building up 
kind of this mountainside and then you're placing out these big polyomino tiles, kind of like Baron Park style, but kind of like Gingerbread House, there's gonna be symbols on these tiles and whenever you cover those symbols up, actually kind of like Baron Park as well, <laughs> whenever you cover those symbols up, you will be getting um, different things. You can get kind of like different villagers, which will have like ongoing abilities. You can um, get resources. You want those resources because you are trying to attract llamas to your kind of mountainous area. And uh, you do that by uh, collecting these resources, which is like potatoes, corn, and cacao, I believe. And then you turn those in to get llama cards. And then you actually have to put a little llama people in your mountain area. Now, the thing about that is once there's a llama there, you can't ever cover that llama up because it's a little meeple and that would kill the llama. So you can't do that. And so then you start to have to like work around the llamas as you're gathering them. And then there's all these kind of public goals that everyone is racing for. It might be like the first person to have llama, like three or four llamas on level three or above. And so you're racing to do all these things. It's really nice for a Phil Walker Harding game. It's actually a little bit heavier, not heavy, don't get me wrong, it's Phil Walker Hardy still, he does family weight games, but for Phil Walker Hardy game, it's actually got, got a little more meat on the bones and I really, really enjoy it. Number seven is Legacy of You. This is a, a resettable campaign game that's solo. It's for one player only. This is from Garfield Games. Uh, and this is a, a game where you are going through uh, I guess up to 14 or 13 plays. You're trying to get to seven victories before you have seven defeats. Uh, and you're gonna see about 40% of the content when you go through it once. There's some story elements and stuff, so you can, again, fully reset the game and play it again and again. In this game, you are managing a pool of workers and resources uh, and your cards to build out canals. Like the Yellow River is <laughs> flooding constantly and it's a really kind of dangerous time to live and agriculture is hard to develop because your crops are getting ruined constantly. There's, uh, you know, struggles to feed your people and things like that. And there's also kind of, you know, uh, neighboring uh, clans and stuff that are threatening your lands as well. So in this game, you need to build out different canals. You're actually going and building canals and sort of taming the river. You are making it much safer to live near and stuff. Uh, and you are managing what's ultimately fairly tight resources because you only have so many workers, you only have so much time because this flood marker is kind of constantly chasing you down and it becomes a game of how best to use those resources from round to round and then from game to game. Uh, do I focus on, you know, these, these hordes that are coming in and threatening our land so I try to spend my resources there? I can't get overrun by them or else I lose. Uh, I need to keep building these canals and kind of stay ahead of the flood. So do I prioritize that this round? Uh, do I build out buildings and stuff so I have more opportunities to gain income and trade and stuff like that so I have a little more flexibility within the round? All these things are, are things to consider. And one thing that's really, really great that I've enjoyed a lot about this campaign is as you go through, if you lose a game, your next game, you're gonna get a little something that makes your life just a little bit easier. If you lose again, you're gonna get another thing that makes your life just a little bit easier. And so it kind of scales with you. And then the inverse is true, where if you start winning a bunch of games back to back to back to back, you're gonna have additional challenges they have to face. So it kind of scales itself as you go through, which I think is just kind of a really brilliant uh, design element to be able to do that, kind of a, a self-scaling game. Uh, and so it makes it so that you get to go deep into that campaign every time. Uh, and then again, you're not gonna see all the story elements the first time you go through, so you can just play it again and again. Number six for us is our most played game ever. And this is Legendary, a Marvel deck building game. I love Legendary. I kind of been getting back into it recently because it's just so darn fun. This is a, a pure deck building game, a cooperative game where you're gonna have uh, generally five heroes that you're choosing from. So it'll be like Wolverine, Jean Grey, Blade, uh, uh, <laughs> Black Panther, and Captain America. Who knows? There's literally hundreds of heroes in this game at this point. And you're choosing five heroes and that's gonna make up the general deck. And each player is gonna be getting these cards but no one's playing a specific hero. No one's like, Mike is Wolverine and I'm Captain America and she's Scarlet Witch and all this kind of stuff. No, it's not like that. You're getting cards and you can have a mix up of all these different cards and then you're gonna be going up against a mastermind. Your goal in the game is to essentially defeat the mastermind four times. But that mastermind will have villains with them and there's constantly villains coming into the city. So you're trying to manage that and keep them out because as villains escape the city, bad stuff, 
happens a lot. And then there's also going to be a scheme. And again, there are hundreds of schemes. And the scheme is gonna change up the rules of the game um, and is basically usually gonna have some other way that you can lose. And so you're basically trying to manage the scheme, manage all the villains, try to build some cohesive uh, deck building elements with all these different heroes who all have different keywords, they all have different symbols, and having to work them all together and okay, I can get this card, this card allows me to draw two more cards, okay, now I can play this one, this one is boosted because of this card that I played. You're really putting together some really cool combos and you're trying to essentially get enough attack to hit the mastermind. The mastermind is usually gonna be the strongest um, character out there and uh, is usually gonna have a lot of extra stuff that goes along with them as well. There's so much variety in this game. Like I said, we, at this point, we have less than half of the stuff for Legendary because we stopped collecting it years ago. And we have, I think like 120 different heroes there's something like 40 different masterminds, a billion different <laughs> villains, and like 150 different schemes. The variety is literally in the quadrillions, quintillions, whatever. I mean, you can play this game so many different ways. Still love it. I, and I, I'm always tempted to get more legendary, but I'm like, we have enough. It's what it is, but I love legendary. Number five is Lacrimosa. Lacrimosa is uh, a music themed game or a game where you are a follower, uh, part of the inner circle of Mozart. And after Mozart has passed away, you are uh, trying to get his final Requiem finished for one. And you are kind of reflecting on your times, uh, times you traveled with Mozart uh, and trying to kind of, I guess, convince people essentially that you had the most impact on Mozart's life. Uh, this is a kind of an action selection game via cards that you're playing. Uh, and you're gonna be doing this to, again, work on uh, this unfinished piece of music uh, and hiring uh, composers and stuff and finishing the different movements within that piece. Uh, you are traveling around, which again represents your kind of memories of times that you traveled around to different cities in Europe with Mozart. Uh, and things like that. One thing I really enjoy about this game is that the turn structure, the action types you can take are fairly simple. Uh, you know, moving from a location to location, grabbing some bonuses and stuff like that are not complicated. It's, it's quick and easy to kind of take your turns uh, and you are gaining cards that upgrade. So you get stronger versions of those actions, but the actions themselves stay simple. Uh, you know, your ability to gain more cards and stuff like that. And the things you're kind of going for are simple. And it kind of adds up to this kind of nice, robust gaming experience. Uh, also, one thing we think is like beige is not always easy to pull off in games. <laughs> and I think Lacrimosa does a great job of feeling in its time period and kind of having that beige Euro look while still being very pretty, uh, at least to us. Uh, we think it looks really kind of great. So, you know, kudos to that. It's like, hey, you can make these kind of older European games look really good and look in their time. Number four is quickly becoming one of my favorite cooperative games, and this is The Loop, 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 Loop. Because you're, you're looping. It's time, it's time stuff, timey-wimey stuff. Basically, this is a game where there is Dr. Foe. Dr. Foe is the big bad, and he is going through time and putting out clones of himself in this time and creating havoc. And then you are kind of like time skipper people, and uh, everyone has a specific character that has a specific ability and then a deck of cards, and you are deck building, and you're basically going through different parts of time. There's like Age of Antiquity, the Renaissance, modern days, the end times. You're basically, it's all in a big kind of circle. This kind of like septagonal board, because I think it's seven sided board. And you're basically going around trying to, to manage. It's a very much a crisis management game, like Pandemic, although it doesn't play anything like Pandemic. But it's a big crisis management game because every round, uh, Dr. Foe, you're gonna be taking some uh, crisis cubes 
and you're gonna be dropping them into a, a, a cube tower and they're gonna go out into time and you don't really know where they're gonna go out and if a certain amount of these cubes end up, ends up in an area that is going to have like some big crazy vortex, it's basically shutting it down and you don't want, there's a whole bunch of different ways to lose and it's super, super hard, but you're basically going around trying to get these clones back to their original area. So this clone is like a Renaissance clone, but it's in the end times. So you need to get it back over to the Renaissance, which essentially destroys it. You also can, put out these energy cubes and those are very very important because they allow you to loop looping is a big part of the game because you're playing out these cards and the cards will have symbols in the top left corner i think there's like three or four different symbols and you can play cards and you can use them and kind of tap them and then you can also take up an energy off the board and you can re-ready all cards of like one symbol. So like, oh, these three cards have the same symbol. I can ready all those again and I can play them again. And then I can loop again, but this time it's gonna take two energy. And then I can loop again, but it's gonna take three energy. So sometimes you can kind of go like two or three times in one turn and you're doing that by looping. And that's a big part of the game. And I just love this game. I love the look, it's very colorful. It's super difficult. There's all these different ways to play. There's all these different modules. The characters are super fun. And I don't know, there's something about this game that I just love. I love crisis management games. And at this point, the loop is probably my favorite of all of them. Number three is Last Will. This is a game where your uh, uncle, I believe it is, has just passed away and they have a large inheritance that's only gonna be given to the person that is the kind of most uh, destitute and sad in life. And so you are a person of means and so your job is now to sell off everything you can at as little return as possible and basically lose all of your cash. Lose all of your cash, lose all of your possessions to be the, the poorest, most sad family member so that you can then become the richest, most happy family member. And <laughs> this is something that we just really laugh at, the idea of like purposefully nerfing your own life <laughs> for this like greedy, uh, for this greedy ambition. So uh, this is one where you're gonna be putting out workers and stuff. And again, you have this whole idea of like, you wanna buy houses at the top of the market and let that house depreciate in value and then sell it at the bottom of the market, which is the opposite of a typical uh, board game or life advice is you wanna buy low, sell high, and just the, taking the idea of doing that and flipping it around. So you wanna kind of tank yourself as much as possible is actually something that you're kind of doing similar stuff that you would, but everything's reversed, which just makes it really kind of fun to imagine if this person was real and I was running around doing these things, like how reckless of a life <laughs> this would be. You're out, you know, taking all your friends out to expensive dinners and things and just blowing through your cash uh, as quick as possible. So it's kind of fun to play, uh, you know, a, a, a cat, a little bit of a villainous kind of character a little bit uh, in ultimately a safe environment. So that is Last Will. Number two is gonna be The Lost Ruins of Arnok. Love Lost Ruins of Arnok. This is a game that's been supported very well by CGE and we just really enjoy it. In this game, you are archeologists and you are kind of like delving into the jungle looking for ruins and trying to research those ruins. And there is, this is kind of one of those uh, worker placement deck building games that tend to be very popular right now. Um, but this is a game and I love games to do this. This is a game that's all about trying to extend your turn as long as possible. Every single round, you're gonna be like uh, playing cards which are gonna give you resources. You're like, oh, this resource, I can now do this thing and that's gonna give me these two other resources. And now with those resources, I can go do this other thing which is gonna give me this. That then allows me to do this. And you're just trying to extend your round because there's only five rounds in the game. And so you have to really extend as far as you possibly can with everything you've got to try and do as much as possible. And it's a deck building game, so you're getting new cards that are cooler and cooler and cooler. You're finding these awesome, cool temples, but they're, they're um, guarded by these big, crazy guardians, so you have to overcome them. It's just really, really fun. And they've supported the game well. They've come out with the Expedition Leaders expansion, which makes everyone different. Everyone has a special power, which is like absolutely outstanding. They came out with a solo and cooperative, two-player cooperative like campaign mode. I just love this game. I never ever can get enough of it. It's just fun. I love the look. It's just, it's just right in my alley. It's great. Mm -hmm. 
Number one on this list is Lisboa. This is a big, chonky game, a uh, heavy game from uh, Vitala Cerda, uh, where you are uh, different, you know, kind of merchants and, and things who are, are helping to rebuild Lisbon after uh, kind of several tra tragedies, things that all linked to a big earthquake that happened. So a big earthquake happened that caused fires to break out through the city and then tsunamis to come in and flood. Uh, and so you have kind of a city that's, you know, getting back onto its feet after uh, these events took place. Uh, and you're gonna see that represented in the game via these cubes of, of white, red, and blue to represent those, uh, the damage done by those uh, earthquakes, fires, and uh, floods. Um, and you're building up the city, clearing rubble, putting shops back into town, kind of acquiring the help of nobles, getting shipping done, uh, and, and moving goods around and stuff like that. So, Vitalis Erda always makes really, just again, big, we call them crunchy uh, board games where there's a lot of things to decide. The resources are fairly tight. You're really trying to eke out every single thing you can uh, via this card play that you do. It's like, how do I make sure that every action I take is impactful? You know, I don't have a wasted moment essentially because you only have so much time in the game. Uh, and this is one, again, you know, tool, wonderful art. It's really kind of beautiful in its uh, starkness, I'll say. Um, it's one that just creates really interesting, tough decisions about like these meager resources I have. Everything's expensive. Clearing rubble and stuff's expensive. How do I make it kind of as valuable as I can? And then especially as you kind of get some, some cards that are gonna help you with end game scoring and stuff, or these tiles, I should say, how do I then tailor my uh, strategy toward these things that are now valuable for me? So uh, doing that, stretching that money as far as you can, those resources, building up uh, those buildings so that you kind of trigger the most uh, income possible and stuff like that. It's just really fun, really uh, <laughs> it takes up, at least for our meager brains, a large portion of our processing power. Uh, but it's really fun every time to come back to and one that I personally think is really kind of quite beautiful in its way. So that is Lisboa. So that was our top 10 games that start with L. Some really good ones in here. Some licorice games. <laughs> that you Just know think of L words, it. you know. Licorice, okay, down in the comments. Black licorice, yay or nay? Yeah, we're yay on that. We're nay. We're okay, very, we're very split nay. House. It doesn't matter. Very nay. But do, if you've been following along uh, with us, please give us your games that start with the letter L that are your very favorites. We love seeing uh, what everyone's kind of opinions are as yeah. we go through this list. Please hop in and join. It's super fun. It's just a fun exercise in thinking about games. Uh, so next up is, I don't know, what comes after L, Nick? Uh, M. Boom, that's what we'll see you next time in the uh, next letter in the alphabet.